Alrighty, well this evening we're going to continue our study on the, uh, the Holy Spirit. And remember the, uh, the reason why we're moving into this particular study is just to follow up with what we had learned from the, uh, the Great Awakening. Uh, we don't want to forget the, uh, the part that the Holy Spirit plays in the work of salvation, advancing the kingdom of heaven. We want to remember that He is the one that the Lord sends to change hearts. He is the one with the power uh, to, to do that. Uh, we need his ministry to change our hearts, I mean, to convert us to Christ to begin with. But we also need his power to have um, strength to be able to do his will. And, of course, we need to pray that God would send his spirit to uh, basically um, change the hearts of the unconverted around us and um, also those around the world. The kingdom... Uh, the Holy Spirit is the one who advances the kingdom of heaven. That's his work, to take what Jesus Christ has done and to apply it to those whom the Lord would have him to apply it. Now, last time we considered, uh, first of all, that the Holy Spirit is a person. And can you remember why it is that we even need to ask the question or why we need to deal with that? Donna? Okay, because of cults that uh, believe that he is some kind of impersonal force. Does that happen at all within the church as well? Okay, and why, why is it that uh, Christians might think the Spirit of God is not a person but some kind of a force? Well, certainly it would be a misinterpretation. Uh, funny thing is a lot of Christians uh, don't read their Bibles. And that can certainly be problematic uh, because they're going to go on just what they hear from the pulpit. And if the personality of the Spirit isn't focused on, and if, if we keep talking about Him in the sense of God sending His Spirit, uh, people being filled with the Spirit, people being empowered with the Spirit, uh, having more or less of the Spirit, sometimes that kind of language can lead us to believe it's some kind of a quantity or some kind of a power doesn't necessarily have a, pers a personality. But we saw that isn't the case, and we need to make sure that we remember that that isn't the case because this person, uh, if you are a believer, is actually residing in your soul. He is a constant uh, traveling companion, you might say. But, of course, he's much more than that. Now, how do we know the Spirit of God is a person? Can you remember the uh, attributes of personality? Any of them? Okay. They're on the board, and um, let's see. Define a person. Well, a person has, I think, first of all, he has uh, self-consciousness or self-awareness. That is, he knows of his own existence, and certainly the Spirit of God knows that. Uh, he is rational. At least, um, I should say that a person is rational, able to reason, able to reflect. A person is moral that is inclined towards good or evil. A uh, person has affections. That's what I think it means by uh, the fact that he is moral, or he or she, depending on the person. Uh, purposeful, uh, makes uh, choices based on reasoning and based on affections, based on what one desires. And of course, we saw the Spirit of God has these attributes. Let me just say uh, quickly in review some of the things we saw about the Spirit. First of all, he helps. He convicts, he guides, he teaches, he speaks, he hears, he takes and he gives in the sense of uh, taking what, what is of Christ and he gives it to his church. He is called in scripture he, that is a um, personal pronoun that is masculine as applied to him and that's interesting especially because often in scripture the pronouns that are used to refer to the spirit are in the neuter form the reason being that uh, the word spirits in Greek is neuter. And of course, the pronouns used to uh, refer to it are going to agree with the noun they refer to. But when you have a neuter noun and then you have a masculine personal pronoun, it just brings out even more the fact that he is personal. He can be grieved. He can be quenched. His guidance, his direction can be resisted. He can be lied to. He can be blasphemed, 
Uh, he issues commands, he sends, he comforts, and he prays. Okay, these are just several of the things we looked at. By the way, I, when you have the list in front of you like this, and I hope it's evoking memories from last time, it, it's clear that the Spirit of God is a person. And yet, to, to, it, so many ignorant uh, Christians or believers who haven't really been taught might struggle when they're confronted with a Jehovah's Witness who claims that the Spirit of God is not personal. It's obvious that he is. I mean, it's quite clear, there's no question. Now again, it's important that you believe this, that the Spirit is a person, uh, for one thing, because if you didn't believe he was a person, you really wouldn't be believing in the true God. You do have to believe the Spirit of God is a person, really, in order to be saved. But it's also important because he resides in your soul and because he's there for a reason. Uh, he is there, to, of course, to transform you into the image of Christ, but he's also there to guide you. He's there to empower you. He's there to make you holy. And realizing that he is a person and not just a force, what we do is going to have an impact on him. Uh, he is going to um, respond to the things that we do. Uh, if, for instance, we do not honor him or we resist him in our thoughts, or in our words, or in our actions, and even in the intents of our hearts, that can quench him. And it, when, it, when he, of course, is quenched, uh, he withdraws part of his influence. He doesn't actually leave our souls. If we are believers, he will always be there. But his influence will be weaker, which means our ability to serve the Lord and to honor him will be weaker than it would be otherwise. And of course, if you're a Christian who is concerned about serving the Lord, you do not want to weaken or grieve or resist the Holy Spirit. Rather, you want to strengthen his work. So knowing that he is a person, of course, makes a big difference in the way that we treat the Holy Spirit. Again, he's not just this sensation of love in my heart. He's actually personal, and he lives in my soul, uh, in your soul, if you're believing in him. So be careful how you treat him. Now, tonight we're going to uh, want to look or be reminded of the fact that he is also God. So this person who is residing in our soul is not just a person, but he is a divine person, which makes it even more important that we treat him uh, the way that we should, that we honor him, worship him, submit to him, and so forth. Now, actually, I've just already um, sort of hedged on uh, the, the question I'd like to begin with, and that is, why is it important that we believe that the Spirit is God? And uh, perhaps we could um, come up with some reasons. I mean, everything that God tells us in His Word is important. The fact that He singles out the Spirit of God as a person is important, of course, to know who the true God is, but also because of our relationship with Him. It's also important that we know that he's God, and why is it important that we know that? What are some of the reasons you can think of that, um, that really has to do with, that makes a difference in time? The first commandment. Okay, so um, can you spill that out, or fill that out a little bit more, not make me fill it out? <laughs> Okay, now there's, there's, the, uh, there's the point, okay? The point is, if, if he isn't God, you know, then well, we're, 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 we would be worshiping a false deity if the deity we're worshiping did not include a personal spirit who is also God, okay? So in order to have the true God, we must understand that the Spirit is God, okay? Can you think of another reason why it's important? Uh, 
that we believe that, that he is God? Okay, we'll probably wrap that up in that, that same idea. Does, does the, we're going to see in just a moment, but uh, you know, one, several reasons why we believe this to be true. Sarah? Okay, well, all right. Uh, yeah, okay, let's say um, that we honor him as the true God. Okay, first of all, that he be the true God, and I suppose that would follow on with what Ty was saying too, that we honor him as God, since he is the God that we worship. If we didn't believe he was God, we're certainly not going to honor him as God, and if we don't honor him as God, then, um, well, we'll get, we're going to see in a, in a few moments that um, offenses against the Holy Spirit are particularly serious, and we don't want to be guilty of slighting him. Um, as you know, what blasphemy against the Spirit of God uh, entails. So, okay, any other reasons why it's important? I think under honoring Him as God, the one that was just mentioned, we do want to be even more careful not to offend Him, although we don't want to offend any of the members of the Godhead. As I just mentioned, there is um, a, well, a, a particular warning against offending the Spirit of God in Scripture. And we're going to not look at that this evening, but we'll probably see that in the near future, why that is the case. Okay, what does the Bible teach regarding the deity of the Holy Spirit? Does the Bible teach that He is the Spirit of God? Okay, well, if we're going to believe the Bible, then, then it's important that we believe that the Spirit is, is God, right? So um, that would have to do, of course, with what the Bible teaches. Can we... Um, can we pick and choose what we're going to believe in the Bible? No. See, everything it says we have to accept, right? So that's one thing. Um, if he is God, what does that say about um, how we should respond to him? Okay, so we should, we should honor him as God and... Okay. He, he has authority, which means we need to obey him if he is God. Now, um, we'll, we'll look at this perhaps a little bit later, not tonight, though, but the Spirit of God, of course, guides us, and he does, in fact, issue commands to us, and we need to submit to him because he is God, okay? Uh, being God, does that mean that he has certain uh, abilities that might be important to us? Okay, um, if the Spirit of God uh, promises, the Spirit of God is the one who actually gave us the Word of God. If He tells us that He's going to do certain things for us, um, does the fact that He is God inspire within us a certain kind of confidence uh, that He is able to do that? Okay, so the idea is uh, that He has power as God, and that will allow us to perhaps trust that he's going to be able to fulfill whatever it is he says he's going to do. Uh, is this, what, what, is the, what is another way that the Spirit of God is actually represented in Scripture? Um, he's, he's called um, like, a, like a foretaste. Uh, can you think of um, another term that, that uh, has to do with that? I'm sorry? The earnest. Okay, the earnest and down payment, which is the same kind of thing. The, he is the um, he is the down payment of the, the full inheritance. He is the the taste, the foretaste of of glory, and uh, the one who gives us or who is the foretaste of glory is in fact himself God. So, being that uh, that he is he is the gift given to us, it certainly tells us how special that gift is that God has given to us, right? If, um, if he is God, oh, I'm sorry, Donna. Certainly. Okay. 
Right, and the one who is helping us is God. I mean, the one who uh, came into the world to obey for us and to die for us is God in human flesh. Uh, the one who chose us is God. The one who comes and uh, restores us and transforms us and comforts us and ministers to us is God. Um, the work of salvation is from first to last the work of God. Now, um, because he is God, what do we owe him? Well, we certainly owe him everything, yes, and because he's given us everything, what, what else do we owe him? Okay, and so what do we owe him, though, for that? What's that? Praise, okay, praise and worship. Because he's God, he should be worshiped. So does it matter that, um, that we believe the Spirit of God is God? Well, yes, because we need to worship him. If we don't believe he's God, we're not going to be worshiping him, right? So that's important that we believe he be God for that reason. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, I just had uh, one other thing. Why is it important uh, also that we know how to demonstrate that he is God from the Bible? What's that? Okay, why would we want to do that? Okay, so they're wrong. We need to show them that they're wrong in order that what? Okay, in order that they might be saved. That's, that's certainly one part of it. And um, what, what is it? Uh, if you have these anti-Trinitarian groups that, that deny the deity of, of the Holy Spirit, what are they doing to him? Are they, yeah, uh, well, they're certainly dishonoring him. And maybe, well, I suppose if you really think about it, maybe they are blaspheming him. But, but not in the sense that, you know, it's a rather strong term. But they certainly are dishonoring him. If everybody, well, I mean, if they were actually blaspheming him, then there really wouldn't be any hope for them, right? They wouldn't be able to be saved, right? Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit has no forgiveness. So if, now, if they did it in clear light, I mean, if they knew the Bible actually taught that he was you know, God and he was personal and they continue to insist on this, they, they could blaspheme the Holy Spirit. They certainly are and you know, they're dishonoring him so it, it's important for us to be able to defend the honor of the Holy Spirit. I mean, when the disciples were uh, uh, and the apostles were preaching that Jesus Christ was the Messiah and that he's the Son of God, there's a certain sense in which they were defending his honor because they were calling him a phony and a charlatan and, uh, and even in league with the devil and so forth. So they were defending Christ's honor as well as uh, proclaiming him as the way of salvation. So in a certain sense, it's important for us to know how to defend the deity of the Spirit to defend his honor too. I mean, again, he is a person. He is God. We would defend the Father, I would think, before men. We would defend Jesus before men. Wouldn't we defend... The Spirit of God as well, if we, if we uh, love Him. Being God, well, not only should we um, uh, do this to defend, uh, it's getting worse, to defend, of course, His honor. Hmm. But I just thought of another reason why it's important that we know that He be God, and that is not only do we owe him, well, it's probably pretty much the same thing as uh, honoring him as God, but also that we might love him. You know, he, he is the love of God, and he's the one that gives us the grace to be able to love God, but that love that he gives us also must be directed towards him because he is God. So being God, we, we owe him love, and how much love do we owe him? To love him with all our hearts and mind and soul and strength. That applies to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I think sometimes we tend to kind of leave him off, don't we? But, but we, we can't. And our confession reminds us as well that uh, each of them is, is worthy of worship and so forth because they are equally God. Okay, so I think uh, there's enough reason for us to be able to defend his deity. Let's, let's do this um, and let's see, 
I think what I'd like to do here is, is uh, assign verses again. Oh, Dominique, you have a comment, question? Well, um, here's where Jonathan Edwards can be, um, again, very helpful. Uh, the, the only difference between a believer and an unbeliever is the fact that the believer has the Holy Spirit united with his soul as an active principle within his soul producing a love for something that the person did not love before, which is God and, and God particularly for his holiness. So what the Spirit of God does when he unites himself to our souls is he gives us a new faculty to be able to see uh, the beauty of holiness where we couldn't see it before so that our hearts are drawn out to it. Uh, it he, he gives us a taste, as it were, or a relish for that which is morally upright and pure of which God has an infinite, you know, an infinite degree. So in essence, we might say he gives us a love for holiness, and the way that he does it is by opening our eyes to see the beauty of it so that's, in essence, what he does. And that, the scripture talks about, uh, I think it's uh, Peter, I forget whether it's first or second Peter, where he says that we are partakers of the divine nature. That divine nature is the Holy Spirit working within us the same kind of character that God has because he has an infinite love for what is morally pure and holy as well. And he gives that to us by his Holy Spirit. That's what was lost in the garden when Adam sinned and what is restored when the Spirit comes back uh, to reside within our souls again. So that's what the whole work of redemption is, is really about, is to bring the Spirit of God back to us so that we might love what God loves. We might love Him, love His Son, love those in His image, love His Word, and everything that, that really reflects the holiness of God. Yes, and that is what we call grace, saving grace. Okay, well, why don't we do this as far as um, uh, proving that the uh, Spirit of God or that the Bible teaches the Spirit of God is, in fact, God. We've already seen that he's personal. Now we want to see that he is divine. Now, some of these are um, some of the standard arguments that are used, standard passages. Some of these might require a, maybe a little bit of thinking, but maybe not a great deal. So first of all, uh, let's, let's get some volunteers. Who would like to volunteer to read Acts 5, verses 3 through 4? Okay, Sarah, Acts 5, verses 3 through 4. Matthew 12, 31 and 32. Okay, Donna? Matthew 12, 31 and 32. And there's actually two arguments that come out of that passage. And then if somebody could volunteer to read Matthew 28, 19, Brian, okay, Matthew 28, 19. Somebody volunteer to read Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. <laughs> Dick, okay. And then, uh, Kathy, if you would read 1 Corinthians 2, verses 10 through 11. And did I have any other more, any more volunteers, Pam? 1 Corinthians 3, 16 through 17. I'll tell you what, why don't we stop there for now, although I have a bunch more. We'll see how far we get with these. <laughs> okay, Acts chapter 5, verses 3 through 4. If you would read the passage and then tell me why you think uh, that this proves that the Holy Spirit is God. Now, does this passage prove that the Holy Spirit is God? Uh, yes. Okay, and how? Because you can't lie to 
Okay, now that's, that's talking about the personality of the Spirit. Why do we believe that this passage tells us the Spirit is God? That's right. Okay, so lying to the Holy Spirit is the same as lying to God, right? Okay, good. So there, I mean, here's the clearest passage. Uh, well, not the clearest, but certainly one that gets right to the point. To lie to the Holy Spirit is to lie to God. Matthew 12, 31 through 32, who had that? Did, oh, somebody took off? Okay. You're going to read that? And, and be prepared also to give a reason why you think uh, the reason why, the, uh, from this passage, why you believe that the Holy Spirit is God. Okay. So what, what uh, reason, <laughs> what, what indication is there in this passage that um, the Holy Spirit is God? Much greater sign than sign of Okay. That certainly is one argument. Much greater than, than, than uh, slandering whom? The Son of Man. Okay, the Son of Man. Um, Let's see, did we not include the other? Okay, well, I think the passage goes on to talk about the fact that even any sin committed against the Father can be forgiven. Any sin committed against the Son would be forgiven, but the sin committed against the Holy Spirit would not be forgiven. Does that say something about who the Holy Spirit is? Um, I don't think that the Lord is assigning an arbitrary punishment as though, uh, well, if you, if you eat radishes, you're, you know, you'll never be forgiven. You know, I, I mean, when the Lord does something like this, or anything, there has to be a just reason for it. And uh, eating radishes, you, there wouldn't be any just reason to condemn a person forever for eating those, at least, if that is sort of singled out as an unpardonable sin. I mean, if God tells you not to eat the radishes and you eat them, that's worthy of eternal punishment because you're, you're disobeying him. But he couldn't single that particular crime out as a sin that could not be forgiven, but he does with the Holy Spirit. Jesus even says, whatever you say about me, however you treat me, that can be forgiven. However you treat the Father, that can be forgiven. But if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, that can't be forgiven. I think it tells us something about his particular worthiness. Not that it's greater than the Father and the Son, but actually, as we, as we look at the, um, the different characteristics of each person of the Godhead, we're going to see why it is that perhaps that sin is the unpardonable sin, whereas sins against the Father and the Son would not be. Now, is there anything else in that passage that anyone can think of that would show that the Holy Spirit is God? Yes. Yes, now that's something, I remember the Thai challenge last week, and the interesting thing is the word blasphemy itself has to do with offending deity. So the word blasphemy always has to do with offending deity. However, the word in the Greek sometimes is used of offenses from one person against another, and it, but it's translated differently in our English, in, well, in our Bibles to reflect that it's not an offense against deity when, when it's done in that way. But our English word, okay, always refers to that. Now, the fact that the Greek word doesn't means that that in and of itself may not be an argument because it could be, you know, offenses against lesser beings. But when you realize that this sin is unforgivable, then you realize that blasphemy could be the only meaning of that particular word in this context because it is an offense against deity. So... The fact that he can be blasphemed means that he is divine. And the fact that if you do blaspheme him, you're, you'll never find forgiveness, okay? There's no forgiveness for that sin also indicates that he is divine. Okay, who has the Matthew 28, 19? Yes.
Okay. Right. I mean, okay, so he, you basically have Jesus' command to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we're so used to hearing that. We just take it for granted that that's, of course, the, you know, the names you're going to hear. But the fact that all three of them are put together in, in equality, basically. You could not string other names together like in the name of the Father, Son, and Paul, for instance. It's not, not going to work, right? Or Peter or any of the other apostles or any other person that you could possibly think of. But the fact that you have these three names that are used together show equality. And certainly you would expect that, so the fact that we have a triune God. Uh, another one that I didn't assign, 2 Corinthians 13, 14, where uh, Paul in his benediction to the church at Corinth says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Again, talking about each of them in their work of redemption, but again, there are these three persons that are involved in it. And the reason why, of course, they're singled out is because they are God, but these are the ones who deserve to be honored for this work of salvation. And so they are three that are being honored here. One God, the three persons. Okay, uh, let's see if we can find another argument uh, from Acts 13, verses 1 through 4. Okay, is there anything there that jumps out at you as far as um, his divinity? Okay, so he is his personal. What about his deity? Is there anything there about deity? It's not, it's not perhaps as obvious as some of these other passages, but... Okay, so there, there is authority that is exercised here, and, and who, uh, over whom is this authority being exercised? The church. the church. I mean, who has the right to command the church? Uh, the right, the Lord. I mean, man doesn't have that authority, and created beings don't have that authority, but... The Lord has the authority to command his, his people. But here's one who's exercising lordship over the church. And certainly we know he also is, is guiding. That's why the um, book of Acts has been expanded to uh, the title to Acts of the uh, Apostles or Acts of the Holy Spirit, really. It's the continuing acts of Christ by his Holy Spirit in his church, not only to, of course, encourage them, but also to, um, well, to even command them uh, to go out and uh, to do what, um, what they should do. I mean, there was a, an instance also where Paul, as he was making his way through Asia Minor, tried to go into particular areas, and the Holy Spirit forbade him to do that. Uh, so again, he's directing, he's guiding, he's commanding, and he has authority because he is God. Okay, um, I think I assigned 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 11, didn't I? Who, who has that? I'm not sure, I don't remember who had them. Is there an argument there for the divinity of the Spirit? No one knows um, the thoughts of a person and of that person. And likewise, no one knows the thoughts of God and the Spirit of God. OK. 
Okay, so he knows the thoughts of God because um, he is the one here who searches the depths of God. Now, what will we say about the thoughts of God? How, uh, how many are there? Yes, they're, they're infinite, they're vast. I mean, how much knowledge does God have? And remember that God doesn't, it's not like it is with us where we have you know, so many brain cells that have knowledge that's uh, stored in them and can be retrieved under certain circumstances and other circumstances. We can't for the life of us remember this person's name or what happened there and so forth. Maybe under certain circumstances we can't. But we have to think about one thing or a couple of things at a time, and we really can't do much more than that. And we, we try to recall things as best we can. But with God, all of his knowledge is immediate, and it's instant, and it's there, present at all times. He sees everything and knows everything. So you might say he has an infinite number of, of thoughts, and the Spirit of God knows those thoughts. Now, how can a being that is finite no infinite knowledge. Is that possible? No. He, he must be infinite as well. He must have infinite knowledge to know the thoughts of God, right? So again, here he has infinite knowledge. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 16 through 17. Okay, Pam. Okay. Actually, you, you hit on the first argument that I didn't think anybody would get. That's good, because the Spirit of God is the author of holiness, and really only God can make something holy, right, in this kind of a sense. Now, if we added to that, did, did I sign any more passages besides that? Okay. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 through 20, listen to this. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Now you are a temple of God, as, we're, as we read in uh, the, the passage that Pam read. If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. Now why are you the temple of God? because the Spirit dwells in you. That makes you a temple of God. How does that make you a temple of God? Because God is in you, right? In essence, that's what it means. The, the, uh, the resident in your soul, this person who is a divine person, is God. And so you are a temple of the Holy Spirit, which is why it's important that you keep your body pure because your body is, in fact, literally a temple of God. So you don't join your members, as Paul goes on to say, you know, to, uh, to a harlot or, or commit acts of immorality because you're sinning against a body which is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So it's important that we um, know how to maintain our vessels and to keep them pure. All right, let's see. We're, uh, as usual, running out of time. I always prepared a little bit too much. Uh, let me just read some passages and then you see if you can... You can tell if there's an argument here for the divinity of the Holy Spirit. Luke 1, 35. The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and for that reason the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. Is there any argument in there for the divinity of the Holy Spirit? Okay, and what would that argument be? Yes, Jerry? What's that? Power of the highest. Okay, the power of the highest. Well, um, you, oh, you mean that he's called here the power of the highest. Okay. The power of the most high. The Holy Spirit is called the power of the most high. So here's actually an argument for um, the um, omnipotence of the Holy Spirit because he is the power of the most high. But why? Oh, yes. So the Holy Spirit is the one who actually brings about the conception of, of 
Jesus in the womb. And because the Spirit of God is the one who is doing this, the child is called the Son of God. Now, that doesn't mean that Jesus is not the eternal Son of God, but it means that his humanity was fathered by God. So in his humanity, he is also the Son of God. Does that make sense? Does it make sense, Jonathan? <laughs> you, weren't, you weren't making that gesture to me. Okay. Um, all right. But do you understand the point? Okay. The Spirit of God is the one who, is, who basically fathers the child, and because he is, the child is called the Son of God. So the, the uh, human nature of Christ here is, is basically called Son of God. All right. Uh, here's, here's another passage, Hebrews 9, 13 through 14. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Okay, what, what an indicator in there is in this text that the spirit of God is God. He's eternal, that's right. And the only thing that is eternal is God. Nothing else is. Matter isn't eternal, even space, unless, of course, space is God, but we'll get into that, but uh, is eternal. Only God is eternal. So if he's called the eternal spirit, he has to be eternal, and he is God. Psalm 139, verses 7 through 10, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. Okay, what does that say about the Spirit of God? Sorry? Okay, he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. There's nowhere you can go to get away from him. And again, only God is omnipresent. Okay, here's one more, Psalm 104, verses 27 through 30. They all wait for you to give them their food in due season. You give it to them, they gather it up, you open your hand, they are satisfied with good, you hide your face, they are dismayed. You take away their spirit, they expire and return to their dust. You send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground, okay? Indicators that the Spirit of God is God? He creates, okay. Now, what this means is, again, as our confession reminds us, that there are three persons in the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're all, of course, we're gonna look at this next time, but they are distinct persons, of course. There are so-called Christian denominations, which we would deny as being Christian denominations, that uh, they deny that the Spirit of God is a separate person. They would, they would agree with us that he's a person. They would agree with us that he is uh, God, but they would disagree with us that he's a separate person or a distinct person from the Father and the Son. But we're going to see that they have relationships that you can't, you can't have if you're only one person. How can the Father, the Son, send the Spirit if they are the Spirit, anyway, so we'll, we'll get to that. But the fact that the Spirit is God means that every attribute that any of the persons of the Godhead have, they all have. I think um, we, we did talk about this once before, but if, if we drew a picture, let's say, like this, and we called this God, when we describe God, we did that in the, in the evening series. We were talking about the attributes of God and why we should love God because of those attributes. Well, any of those attributes, all of those attributes belong to God. So this infinite, eternal, unchangeable spirit that's independent and omnipotent and omniscient and so forth, infinitely wise and holy, that, those, that describes this being, this infinite spirit. But within this being, there are three persons. Again, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And each of them possesses the attributes of this infinite spirit. Okay? So they all have the same 
attributes. However, we're going to see that even though that's true, there is something that seems to distinguish them that is included in the names that they have revealed themselves by, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And when we, when we study those differences, we're basically studying what's called the ontological trinity or what God is in and of himself. Apart from, you know, we, we, there's two ways to understand God. There's what's called the economic trinity, which is the, the roles they take in the working out of redemption, of, ex of executing this plan that God has had from all eternity. But when you consider just who God is, we, we call that the study of the ontological trinity or the being of God. And uh, we're going to see that, well, yes, there is this God who has all this infinite spirit, has all these characteristics, and there's three persons, and then we're going to see why it is the Father is called the Father, the Son, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and uh, why at least Jonathan Edwards believed the fact that the Spirit of God is the Spirit of God is why he is the one who does what he does in particular in the work of redemption. But just remember the Spirit of God, though, being God, being a person, a divine person, is, um, it's important that we believe it for all these reasons, but especially that we may honor him and worship, honor him as God, worship him, and trust in his power, obey him, uh, realize what a special gift we have, realize he is the true God, love him with all of our heart, and so forth, and make sure we defend his honor as we would defend also the Father and the Son. So again, uh, make sure realizing that this one lives in your soul, make sure you treat him with the respect, the honor, and the love, the worship, and so forth that is due to uh, God alone. All right, so next time, well, as I've said, we'll consider the relationship of the three persons and what it is that distinguishes them, even though they ultimately share exactly the same attributes because they are all three the same God. Not the same person, but the same God. Okay. Any questions at this point, Dick? Uh, could you tell me what the person of the Godhead looks like? Uh, person or time the Spirit of Christ that him then will end up being the one who gets his suffering. So the Spirit of Christ, that's, that's the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Would he, that not be a, you know, just again, you were thinking about what causes confusion. Would not something like that possibly cause confusion in the mind? Well, I think um, when you, well, as a matter of fact, um, in Romans chapter 8, the Holy Spirit is called within, I think, either one verse or a couple of verses. He's called the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of Christ. Does that cause confusion? Uh, it, it certainly can. I remember uh, one friend of mine who was studying for the ministry uh, in the Assemblies of God believed that that passage was teaching that there are, there are three spirits. And he, he thought it was referring to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But as a matter of fact, all three of those were terms referring to the Holy Spirit. Um, at least I hope he believed that, because otherwise he's going to end up with several spirits as well as several persons. And, and I think you also have a passage in Revelation that talks about something like the seven spirits of God before the throne and so forth. And that might lead to some confusion. But uh, the fact that he is the spirit of God and he is the spirit of the, I think, in, I have to double check on this, but certainly the spirit of Christ, the spirit of, of the Son and so forth, and the Holy Spirit um, indicates that there is some kind of um, perhaps even, you know, this this kind of, I don't know, it would probably be heretical to say an ontological subordination, but, um, and, and there really isn't. But I think it reflects the relationship that exists between them. You know how <clears throat> one of the historic confessions says that, um, was it the, um, is it the Apostles' Creed now, or is it the Athanasian, no, it's not Athanasian Creed, uh, Nicene Creed, where it talks about the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, and the debate between the Western Church and the Eastern Church over that, one of the reasons why they split was because the Eastern Church, I think, did not believe the Spirit proceeded from the Son. The Western Church believed that it did. That's what's called the Filioque controversy. But the idea that the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son really has to do with the ontological trinity or what God is like in and of himself, and perhaps some of that is reflected in what the Spirit is called, the Spirit of Christ, 
the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. I mean, you don't hear Christ being called the Christ of the Spirit or the Father, something like the Father from the Son. You, you don't see a subordination, as it were, in any sense of uh, the Father to the Spirit and the Son or something like that. But you do see this kind of subordination, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it may have something to do with that relationship and may also have to do with the reason why he's called the Spirit of Christ. Anyway, it's a lengthy explanation. I hope it makes sense. All right, any other questions or comments? All right, then let's um, have a word of prayer and um, we'll then move to the back as uh, maybe take a, just a brief break because we're, again, in my long-windedness, we've gone a little bit over time so that we don't go terribly late. Let's try to get back in the back as quickly as we can, shall we? Let's pray.